So uh, let us just start, and as always, you are more than welcome just to, uh, you know, come in and kind of ask ask again if you don't feel I have answered the question rightly or haven't understood what you're trying to say or whatever. Please just grab the microphone, and we can have a bit of a discussion about it. So, uh, first one, dear Ajahn, relating to Sangyutta Nikaya 47.8, which is the Cook Sangyutta, page 89. What does it mean by they don't take the mind's hint? Uh, <laughs> or they take the mind's hint? Is it referring to how we should adjust our meditation practice depending on what state our mind is in at uh, a different stage? Uh, it, yeah, that's the idea is that you don't really grasp, you know, that there is a hindrance or there is a problem there. You don't fully, uh, you're not able to fully uh, see what, the hap what is happening in the mind and to kind of make the right adjustment so as to overcome those hindrances. Uh, that is really kind of what is meant here by the, not ne by the hint. It's the same thing as the hint of the cook. Yeah, the cook is making the food. Uh, he doesn't see what's going on. He doesn't kind of take notice of what is happening. Uh, in the same way, you don't take notice of what's happening in your mind in the right way so as to overcome the hindrances. Uh, that is kind of the point there. But if you are sharp, if you are careful, if you follow the instructions in the Satipatthana Sutta, you uh, investigate what the problem is, you try to figure out what is going on, uh, you try to investigate the source of the problem, uh, yeah? how does it come about, uh, and then you learn through that to kind of overcome what the issue is. Uh. So you have to kind of use the uh, techniques and the skills that are uh, kind of laid down in the Satipatthana Sutta and elsewhere in the suttas as well. Uh. So, uh, yeah, so you kind of adjust and you kind of learn as you go along with that one. Does that make sense? Yeah? People are happy with that? Uh, okay. Dear Ajahn, what is the origin of the five precepts and the eight precepts? Is it written in the suttas or the Vinaya Pitaka? Also, in the fifth precept, how is intoxication defined in today's context? Uh, is addict addiction to social media, gambling, and chase chasing after the latest trend considered intoxication? <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, maybe we should add some more precepts. I think that might be a good idea, actually. Uh, yeah, cannot go to Facebook or that sort of stuff. Uh, <laughs> actually, maybe Facebook is probably already kind of, we have to ban a few of those sites, I think, social media sites. So. So let's start off with the uh, five and the eight precepts. Are they found? Uh, where are they found? And the eight precepts are found in the suttas, in quite a number of places. Uh, and this was a standard already laid down at the time of the Buddha, that when lay people went to the monastery, they would keep these eight precepts. And there's a nice suttas about that where uh, the Buddha says to the lay people that the arahants keep these eight precepts. So if you keep these eight precepts, you are acting like an arahant for one night or for one day. Yeah, that's quite nice, isn't it? The arahants keep them all the time. And now for one night, you keep them as well. Uh, so kind of you feel like you're walking in the footsteps of the arahant. Uh, yeah, maybe even the footsteps of the Buddha if you keep on practicing like that. Uh. So that is there. The five precepts are are they found in the suttas? Uh, I. I don't think they are found quite in that way. What is the nearest we get to the five precepts in the suttas? Uh, um, ooh, uh, uh, I think it is... Wh what is the nearest we get, get to the five precepts in the suttas? Uh, um, it is, I, I'm not sure where the five precepts, where they occur for the, occur for the first time. I'm not sure about that. Uh, and I, I can't tell you off the top of my head. Do you know, do you know where it is? Uh, wh where in? <laughs> four. Uh, like where? Uh, yeah. Well, the four is more important because the, the one we're drinking is actually quite rare in the suttas. And that, that's kind of the interesting thing about it. Uh, it is not, does not occur so often. But the eight, uh, the eight is certainly there. Uh, um, so I cannot answer that question where the five comes from. But the, I, I know that the eight is found in there. Uh, so. Um, was gee. It, it includes five, but the, the thing is, that what? But that is for the uposatha. You have the eight precepts. The five is supposed to keep all the time, yeah. 
So but the question is, where, where, does it, where does it come from? Uh, where does it come from as a separate group that is supposed to be kept all the time? Because uh, it's, it's a different thing. It does include the five, but it doesn't really give a specific direction about it, how it is to be used and what it is for. Uh. Anyway, so m maybe... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know the answer straight away, but uh, let's just leave it aside for now. Uh, maybe one of yeah let's uh, rather move to the next one which is the Ajahn yeah please yeah just on the uh, yeah the intoxication yeah um, one of the <laughs> brothers actually brought up a computer about that one because we had a discussion about whether yeah um drinking uh, alcohol in moderation whether that was permitted yeah and he uh, directed me to the suit uh, uh sarakana Oh, SM 55.24, yeah. yeah, yeah. and supposedly the Buddha said he was yeah. a stream wi winner, yeah. and the Sakians yeah. um, were complaining that he, this uh, Sakarina, used to drink alcohol. Yeah. yeah. How could he become a stream winner, yeah. even though he was drinking alcohol? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That that is a well-known suit. Uh, exactly. I, I know about that suit now because these are the kind of suitors that are, have, have been controversial probably since the time of the Buddha. So we have probably been discussed over two and a half thousand years. This kind of suitors, and yes, and that, that is an interesting one. So how do we explain that? And. Uh, the way that sutta is phrased, it is a little bit hard to see exactly at what point he became a stream enter. It looks on that sutta, if my memory serves me right, which is uh, uh, possible, but not entirely so <laughs> sure, that he became a stream at the time when he died. Uh, yeah, so at the time, I think that's what happened. When he was passing away, he died. So he may have been drinking all that along, but he may have been a good person in other respects. Uh, and at the moment he died, presumably he gave up drinking a few days before he died. Uh, so he had, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he don't drink to the last minute is usually a bad idea. So then he probably, he, he, he then probably had some kind of remorse for the drinking, He'd, and he gave it up in a more thorough sense, also mentally. Uh, and then somehow, because he had the right qualities at that time, he was able to attain stream entry. Uh. And I think this is one of the points about drinking. Uh, drinking alcohol is not in itself considered bad karma. It is considered bad because you tend to be deluded about what is right and what is wrong. Uh. So you act wrongly. It is called uh, majja, uh, Sura, Meria, Majja, Pamadatana, Sura and Meria and Majja, all of those three mean alcohol. Huh? And Pamadatana means uh, that which is the basis for negligence, basically. Huh? Yeah? So they are the basis for negligence, and that is why it is considered bad. But in its own right, uh, it's not considered very severe bad karma or anything like that. Huh? One of the problems with alcohol that is uh, pointed out in the suttas is, is there is a tendency never to have enough of it. Huh? You always want more. Huh? Yeah, it's like you never can, you can never really drown out your sorrows fully by alcohols. <laughs> and that's often why people drink, because they have you know, too much dukkha in their life or whatever. Yeah. And then you always want more, and it kind of carries on. And sometimes it creates that habit, obviously, you become an alcoholic even. Yeah. And that is kind of the scary thing about it. Once you get used to the taste, and get used to the idea, and you kind of enjoy the intoxication to some extent, uh, it carries on also in your next life. Yeah? It kind of, it's a habit that you bring with you into the future. Uh, and then if it always keeps growing, it is quite scary. Uh, it, it kind of, there is no limit in a sense. Uh. So these are the kind of things that uh, I think are, there are very good reasons for not drinking. And these are the kind of things that I would say you should not drink. Uh, uh, is it against the precepts to uh, uh, drink in moderation? Uh, um, the precept says uh, you should abstain from alcohol and drinks that lead to intoxication. It can be understood in two ways, uh, that you drink to such an extent that it leads to intoxication, or you should abstain completely because by its nature they tend to lead to intoxication. And I think, I think uh, that the right way of interpreting and understanding is, is that uh, you should uh, abandon all alcohol, basically. That's what I think is the, is the meaning of the phrase. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head why I think that, I think there is a, uh, w once you look at the phrase, I think that is the most likely uh, meaning of the, uh, of the words in that particular combination. But I can't tell you off the top of my head why that is the case. Uh, so uh, I, the Sarakani phrase, the Sarakani one is strange, it is unusual, uh, 
but I don't think uh, it means, you know, because of that, that alcohol is actually acceptable. He may not have been keeping the five precepts, that's what I would reckon was the problem. He should have, maybe he would have become a stream mentor long ago, and he had to wait till he, he died. <laughs> you know, that's a possibility, you just don't know what is going on here. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I thank you. I read somewhere, <laughs> I don't remember a long time, it, it said that uh, the five precepts is not ex Exclusively Buddhist. Not exclusively Buddhist. Uh, so who else has it? Uh? <laughs> Maybe the Brahmin. The, Bra the, the Brahmins. Uh. Brahmin? Yeah. I, I read long time ago, but I don't know. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Have you heard? I don't. Th I don't know of anything else, but there are. I think the uh, the Jains had precepts that were quite similar to the Buddhist. Uh. They were quite quite similar. I don't think they, it, it may not have been exactly similar, but they're quite quite similar. So, uh, I d yeah, there's no reason why the five precepts should be exclusively Buddhist because they are kind of moral conduct, and they, they are conduct that most people probably might might believe in, uh, except for drinking. Drinking is quite new, quite not you know not necessarily common, uh, but. Uh, Yes, yeah, so I, that, they, th there's no particular reason why they should have to be exclusively Buddhist. Uh, it is quite p conceivable that they might also um, relate to others. Uh. Uh, then obviously in Christianity they don't have five precepts because they believe in killing animals uh, and they believe in drinking. Yeah, that's considered acceptable. Uh. So Christianity is certainly different. Uh. Um, okay, so uh, what should addiction to social media, gambling, chasing after the latest trend be considered intoxication. <laughs> um, I, 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 it, it is definitely intoxication, or it can be, depending on how you use it. So I, th I don't think there's any doubt about that. But I think whether it should be excluded or not, you cannot really expand the precepts. Yeah, they are given by the Buddha. They are, it, it says specifically alcohol, uh, so that is what the precepts are. Uh, and there's always going to be a degree of intoxication in life. You cannot get away from intoxication altogether. Intoxication with various things, uh, yeah, Se just the sensual pleasures is an intoxication already. So there is a po cutoff point where you have to kind of decide that uh, these are intoxications that are outside of the precepts. Uh, um, because they are, you know, there they must be a cut-off point somewhere, otherwise you can't do anything, yeah? You have to eat kind of uh, rice, white rice and water all the, all the time, because, the, all the, you know, and live, kind of live in a cardboard box, because otherwise you might get intoxicated with all the sensuality in, in the world. So there is a cut-off point where you have to say that, okay, this is no longer part of the precepts. It doesn't mean we can do whatever we want, we still have to be careful, and maybe the best thing is to kind of delete your Facebook account, yeah? I don't know. I, when you read about Facebook, it sounds like a pretty dodgy organization anyway, so maybe the best kind of to just get out of that as soon as possible. Uh, and uh, I've never had a Facebook account in my life, and I, it's actually, I think, I don't know, I have no idea what it's like, but I, I'm quite happy without it. I don't really need Facebook to, <laughs> to make my life kind of work. It's quite nice to be off social media, I think. Uh, I have an email account, that's pretty much how f as far as my social media interaction goes, and e email, I don't, don't do anything more than that usually. Yeah. So, uh, sometimes I think it improves the quality of your life when you delete these things, yeah, get rid of them, chuck them out the window, it may not be a bad thing, it can be hard to do, but many people say they have better life after they do that. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> yes, why, why yes? Yeah. Oh, sorry, you yeah. first, yeah. No. What yeah. about smoking cigarette? Does it come under fifth precepts? Um, I don't think so, because uh, it's supposed to lead to uh, a delusion, yeah, and uh, uh, maja, uh, pamadatana, and uh, smoking does not usually lead to kind of delusion in the same way as alcohol. With alcohol, you really lo lose your bearing sometimes. You don't know what you're doing anymore. Uh, I remember when I was a university student, I used to drink a little bit too much a few times, uh, and really you, 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 lose, you lose your ability to think properly, you know, if you drink a little bit too much. Uh, so it actually has a very bad consequences on you, uh, whereas smoking a cigarette is not, doesn't have that same effect on you. Uh. So I would say no, but obviously I think that as a monastic you have a certain 
obligation to be a good example to the world. Uh, so I think that as a monastic, when we know the health effects of cigarette smoking are pretty bad, yeah, we know that, uh, we shouldn't do it simply for that reason, that you don't want to be a bad example for the world around us. Uh, and I know some of the, one of the monks in Amonas, he used to smoke, and he used to say, yeah, but all the kind of the kubla ajans, the kind of big ajans, they, they used to smoke. So I also, I demand to smoke because of that. Uh, this was an example of how kind of these things carry on from one to another one. But the reason why these ajans in Thailand smoked was because they started before, they didn't know anything about the health effects, yeah. They started back in the 60s or whatever, well, before that time. So you kind of, uh, so f you know, fair enough. Uh, but uh, I don't think we should follow in the same way here. <laughs> yeah, uh, wh wh I think Wei Yin was first. Uh, so maybe Wei Yin uh, can go first. Uh, yeah. What I'm just wanting to yeah. tell you that I use Facebook. Uh -huh. I use it to record all the. It's, it's like my notebook for notebook, all the okay. Ah, okay, okay. So there is wholesome and unwholesome ways of using Facebook. Exactly. Use it in a wholesome way, yeah, exactly. Like so many things, it's how you use that matters, uh, yeah. Good, uh, okay. No, under the pre preset? Yeah. There's a, in Thailand we have some kind of dessert that is, you know, fermented. Yeah. It's, uh, if you uh, keep it for many days, you know, it could <laughs> be like uh, alcohol. Uh -huh. It's made of like uh, <laughs> sweet rice. Okay. Yeah. It's a dessert. Yeah, okay. But uh, I don't know if it's allowable or not. If it has alcohol, you... It, it's yeah. sweet, but, you know, if you keep it uh, many days, yeah. it could become yeah. like alcohol. <laughs> Yeah, so you have to so you have to be careful. If you think that there is alcohol in there, then you shouldn't take it. If you know pretty sure that there is not, then it's okay. Yeah. So you have to kind of make your best judgment. Uh, you can't just take it. You know, it's, it's not yes or no. You have to kind of judge for yourself whether it is likely to have alcohol or not. Uh, that is what you have to do in that situation. Yeah. It, it's not like, but it could taste a little bit. You know, if it tastes like alcohol, you shouldn't have it. You shouldn't have it. <laughs> if it tastes like alcohol, it's, uh, yeah. it's kind of sweet and sour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but the yeah. Yeah. I don't know how they make it, but the sweet <laughs> rice, mm. steam it. And it sounds like you're trying to find an excuse. <laughs> 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 so, sorry, I'm, I'm being naughty. <laughs> 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 Yeah. And it's not uh, it's not common nowadays. Okay. Only you know the old very old generation they know how to make. Okay. In the new generation they don't know. Don't have it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you can if you can smell or taste alcohol then it's it's already too far. Yeah. This is one of the one of the rules for the monastics, if you can't smell or taste alcohol, then you shouldn't take it. Like in a medicine, for example, which is alcoholic, if you can smell or taste, you shouldn't take it. This is it actually there, right there in the alcohol, in the uh, yeah, like rules? So. Yeah, so that, that's, yeah, so that's exactly, so you can't exactly, so there you have to be, you have to be careful, yeah. Okay, sorry. You okay, Barbara? Yeah, you answered already. Yeah, this is a, that's what you have Kalanamita for. You don't, yeah, this is what you can just ask your p person next to you. Huh? Even better. Huh? That's great. Uh, okay, so uh, next question. Are you okay with that one? Uh, everyone happy? Yeah. Okay. Uh, next one. Ajan, can insight be gained from contemplation without or through meditation? Thank you. Um, can insight be gained? Well, it depends what you mean by insight. Uh, and this is kind of the word, a word such as vipassana means something like clear seeing. In my opinion, it does not really mean insight. Insight is more like wisdom. It's like uh, insight means, wow, now I see. It's like the light bulb going up, uh, go going on. Uh, you know the cartoon, when they had to draw cartoons, they draw comics, and someone uh, that has a light bulb going on next to the head, bing, like, yeah, insight. That's what insight is. Uh. <laughs> 
So it's like a moment of wisdom, a moment of understanding. But vipassana is more like a, a continuous thing that mind clears up, uh, and then it becomes more clear, and then you see things more, uh, you understand things more. It's a gradual thing, more clarity about what is going on. Uh. So can insight be had through, without meditation? It depends what you mean by insight, and it depends what you mean by these things. But as you keep the precepts, uh, as you purify yourself by being more kind and more mindful, as you uh, overcome the defilements of the mind by thinking in the right way, you actually gain more clarity. Yeah, you gain more. You start to see the things more, the world in a better way because uh, uh, defilements are, are disappearing. You become more balanced as a person. All of these kind of things. Uh, so just by being kinder, more gentle, more caring, less. Uh, defiled person, uh, actually you have more clarity about the world around you and also about yourself. Uh, yeah, so in this way you have more vipassana just by living in a good way. Uh. But if you want, a pro if what you mean by insight here is like a profound understanding of the nature of reality, uh, like becoming a stream mentor or something like that, if that is what you mean, then the answer is probably no, because you need samadhi to be able to have insight. Uh. And to gain samadhi you need this incredible peace and stillness inside uh, and whether you do that through meditation practice uh, or you can perhaps be done by listening to the Dhamma and then going inside of yourself, yeah? But either way the process is basically the same and the process of peace is like a meditative process uh, and you have to go through that process otherwise uh, you don't get that peace, you don't get the samadhi. Yeah? So uh, if you want real insight, the real deep ones, then the answer is basically yes, you need to do meditation in one way or another to make the mind peaceful enough for, it to, uh, for, for you to be able to, to see those things and make the mind powerful enough, happy enough, clear enough and all these kind of things. Uh. So again, remember all of these things that come in various degrees uh, and depending on the degree you need more calm, more stillness. Yes? No? Maybe? Yeah? <laughs> All of the above. <laughs> uh, okay. Next one. Dear Ajahn, is the Heart Sutra one of the original teachings of the Buddha? Um, so, the. What do you think? Yeah. You think it's original? Yeah. Did you, have you read the Heart Sutra? The uh, Heart Sutra is a sutra fr from the Prajna Paramitra tradition uh, and belongs to that. It is a, like a contraction of the Prajna Paramitra Sutra. It, it contains, I haven't read it, but apparently it contains the essential teachings of Prajna Paramitra. It's one of the most important suttas in Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, and uh, as such, it is no, it is not really early Buddhism, not part of the early Buddhist teachings. Uh, uh, but some of the content may still be compatible with the early Buddhist teachings. Uh, and this is one of those things, just because something is a Mahayana teaching doesn't mean that it necessarily is wrong or it is you know, contradictory to what the Buddha taught. It doesn't necessarily mean that. Uh, what it means is that it is often has elements that are further developed, uh, but some of the elements may be early. Uh, Often the, the, the way that texts develop is very complicated. They often use early ideas and take them further, for example. Uh, it doesn't mean that everything is wrong, but it may mean that certain things are additions, uh, for example. Uh, so, and this is the problem, because they are additions, they may, maybe they are not quite right, or maybe they are slightly misleading, or we don't know who exactly gave us these ideas because we don't know who they are. It's kind of all a bit uncertain. Uh, and that's why it is better to come back to the early teachings. Uh. So if you like the Heart Sutra and you think there are some good things in there, you know, you can, you can read it. Uh, yeah? uh, just be aware that uh, it may not be 100% the way the Buddha would have phrased things. Uh. Okay. Uh, this is going very fast, yeah, which is... Uh, could I suppose? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, dear Ajahn, can you kindly do the sharing of merits to my lay Buddhist teacher, Chua Kar Leong? Chua Kar Leong, okay. He served the Buddhist society in my hometown selflessly for many years. Now he is advanced in age, approaching 90, and is undergoing radiotherapy for his stage 3 prostate cancer. Okay, thank you very much. 
Of course, you can. We'll be very happy to to do that, uh, and uh, so we'll. Uh, I'll put them down on our chanting list, uh, and then we can we we'll do some chanting for him and share merits with him. Actually, we're gonna maybe we will share some merits at the end, very end here as well, and then you can uh, keep in in mind and you can uh, uh, share the merits with him as we do that. Uh. But I will put him especially on the next to it here, so I can remember what's going on. Okay. Uh, Next question, which would be the main teachings and related sutta a student of the Dhamma must, should focus on uh, just to get the necessary knowledge for the practice? Uh, that's a good question. After all these suttas, you wonder, whoa, so many suttas, which one should we focus on? Uh, and I would say one of the suttas that I usually use as the foundation for meditation retreats, because I think it is very practical and very uh, uh, gives gives all the information you need is the gradual training as to what I usually focus on. Uh, not s the Satipatthana Sutta so much because Satipatthana Sutta is one small fraction of the path. It is the mindfulness part, uh, but the gradual training gives you the whole path laid out. It's like the eightfold path, but explained systematically uh, one step after the other. And that would be like Majjhima Nikaya 27, uh, uh, the simile, uh, the shortest, uh, the, suit, uh, the shorter suit on the simile of the elephant's footprint, the one we were just reading from at the very end there. Uh, yeah, that has the whole practice in there, starting with how you become a disciple of the Buddha, all the way to you become an arahant, and all the steps in between. Uh. And it's a very, very useful sutta, and it's uh, a really nice for uh, using when you do medi uh, meditation retreats, especially when you. Uh, have more focus on meditation practice is a very very useful one here. So that is a is a nice one, but um, I think it is nice to sometimes read a little bit more broadly in the suttas, uh, because some of the things that are really important, for example, to get started is the idea of right view, and our modern idea of views, the way we view the world in the modern world, is often very different uh, from the way they viewed the world at the time of the Buddha. Things like rebirth and kamma, for example, uh, are essential part of the Buddha's teachings. Uh, but in the modern world, the rebirth and kamma are kind of not really all that common. A lot of people kind of reject these things. Uh, so for that reason, sometimes we need a bit more in the modern world to be able to really appreciate these suttas. You need to straighten out your view more, to be clear about what matters, uh, yeah, what is... Um, uh, uh, w what are you know? What sh what, where should our priorities lie? What what value should we hold? Uh, uh, and all of these kind of things, and all of that comes out of uh, reading the suttas and getting this right view as a foundation stone. Uh, so uh, I I wouldn't recommend just reading one sutta. That is a very practical one, but I would broaden out a little bit. Uh, one nice book to start with that I sometimes recommend to people is in the Buddha's words. Uh, uh, there's an anthology, a collection of suttas that are thematically uh, put together, so you have various themes. Uh, yeah? It is done by uh, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, who is one of the main translators of suttas, uh, usually very good translations, uh, and lots of introductory uh, explanations, lots of footnotes, and done in a, in a the language is quite accessible, so fairly easy to understand what is happening here. So this is what where I would start. Uh, and uh, read Majjhima 27 and then gradually see what happens. Uh, you can also read the suttas on suttacentral.net, suttacentral.net, sutta central, C-E-N-T-R-A-L, central, and uh, there you have the translation of the whole uh, uh, Tipitaka, I think even, uh, as, at least as it's certainly coming, uh, but all the suttas are there and then you can kind of gradually go through it uh, and enjoy Enjoy the suttas, uh, yeah, uh, and if you don't enjoy it, just skip it and go to the next one. That's my recommendation. Uh, don't read if you don't enjoy here. Yeah. So uh, that's what I recommend. Yes? Okay? Uh, yeah, so the, you know, the just the necessary knowledge for practice is very hard to pin down what is the exactly the necessary knowledge for practice. It depends really on the person, depends on so many factors. Uh, you can't really pin it down quite like that, I think. Yeah. Okay. Dear Ajahn, what is the right attitude towards our work which gives us stress and anxiety? Uh, how do we apply Dhamma to this. Uh, 
Okay, so what is the right attitude towards work that gives you stress and anxiety? Um, well, it, one of the things, the reason why things give us stress and anxiety is often because of uh, how we relate to that work. And one of the ways of relating to work that will reduce the stress is to think that it doesn't matter if I get lose my job or not. Yeah, if you think that it doesn't matter if you lose a job, then uh, when other people kind of when people push you too too hard and they do whatever, then you just shrug your shoulders. Yeah, and say okay, whatever. I, if I lose my job, it doesn't matter, you know. And then you don't allow yourself to be stressed out so much uh, by all these deadlines and being pushed around by people around you. Uh, and that is kind of a, a kind of a nice thing. But in in the end, a job is useful because we have to make a living and all of that. Uh, but it's not kind of it's not you know it's not what life is about uh, yeah having having the right job and sometimes we are in the wrong job perhaps with the wrong people around us sometimes we should perhaps give up our job voluntarily say enough of this uh, yeah the, the work environment here is too hectic and then you downgrade instead of being too uh, you know too ambitious in your job or whatever uh, you kind of you know you become maybe something else you start kind of uh, uh, you know, working in a, in, a, in a simple little place. You come here to the BGF and you kind of wash the floors here in BGF instead, yeah? That kind of job, uh, yeah? That is much, much nicer. Yeah? So you do something like that and then you kind of downgrade. You don't one of the problems, we get stressed and uh, anxiety because we are ambitious as well. We want to get it right. We want to do it this way and we want to have this kind of work. We don't want to work in some kind of lowly occupation. But actually, lowly occupation is good. Yeah, have a lowly occupation, which is where kind of there is less work hours and you can kind of relax more. Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. It's fine. Uh, and uh, I know people, there's one fellow in Perth, he used to be a lawyer. And he got so stressed out of being a lawyer uh, that he gave it up and then he, became, he started to care for the handicapped people instead. Uh, so now he cares for handicapped people, uh, which is kind of like a government job, so much easier, much more, much more relaxing. Uh, and uh, he is a much happier person as a consequence. Uh, he doesn't make a fraction of the money, but he doesn't really care about money, so it doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, so this is uh, the way you have to just uh, uh, establish what is really valuable in your life, what matters the most. Uh, and then you uh, downgrade certain things and you upgrade other things instead. Uh. How do we apply Dhamma to this? Uh, so this is maybe what you do. Uh, and uh, if, uh, uh, you know, one of the, all of these teachings of the Dhamma, they help you to deal with anxiety and stress. Uh, if you have more metta to the people around you, if you have more compassion to the people around you, if you understand them more, uh, yeah, then they will also stress you out much less. If someone is kind of speak to you in an unfriendly way and that becomes stressful, uh, if you have metta and compassion towards them, it doesn't bother you anymore. Uh, and you kind of just shrug your shoulders uh, and uh, you carry on like you did before pretty much. Uh. So uh, there you are. So that is kind of, that is one possibility with that one. Okay, last question. Uh. Dear Ajahn, if someone is of a different faith or who has a wrong view, it may be disagreeable to that person if the person hears the Dhamma. <laughs> is this wrong speech if our intention is to help this person attain right view? Um, <laughs> so, what do we, well, I think you have to know the right time. If you want to help somebody else, you have to do, do it at the right time. Uh, and if you do it at the wrong time, sometimes it comes counterproductive. Uh, so they have to have at least some interest. Uh, yeah? And if you force too much, uh, uh, the views onto other people, actually they become uh, rebellious and they kind of become resistant towards hearing anything instead. Uh, so uh, be, you know, be a little bit sensitive and be gentle with uh, other people. It is not necessarily wrong, you know, uh, but if you can do it in a way whereby they don't have, are so resistant, it is better. Uh, start with something nice, start with kind of uh, some of Ajahn Brahm's stories, yeah. Uh, they kind of, they are so neutral, they're almost non-religious. Uh, some of the stories are just nice stories and they are, you know, regardless of your background, they are kind of acceptable. In Indonesia, Ajahn Brahm's books are bestsellers. 
Yeah, as, uh, literally, it's like they are absolutely on top of the bestseller list. We have like Adam Brown on top, and then you have uh, Harry Potter number two, <laughs> Dan Brown number three. Yeah, that, that's how big they are in Indonesia. Absolutely massive, and the whole population reads them. It doesn't matter if they are Muslims or Christians. Everybody reads them. Yeah, because they are nice stories and they are applicable to everyone. Yeah? And uh, so this is kind of the uh, uh, nice, nice thing about these things. There are anybody can really read them, and this makes it kind of uh, uh, makes the stories easy. And this is kind of an easy approach to dhamma. And uh, th th this is the thing about the Buddhist teachings. They are essentially psychology. It's about how to use our minds in a wise way. So because of that, there's no reason why you can't be both a Christian. And a Buddhist at the same time. Yeah, you can, really. Uh, or you can be a Muslim and a Buddhist perhaps at the same time. Uh, uh, perhaps, I don't know. <laughs> it may not work with, all, with everyone, but sometimes it works. Uh, or you can be anything, because psychology is just psychology. It's a way of you know, dealing with your mind. And for that reason, there isn't really any, it doesn't need to be limited off uh, in the same way sometimes as perhaps uh, other faiths need to be limited off. Uh. So just be gentle and uh, feel if it is the right time uh, and uh, if it isn't the right time then don't do it. Uh, and if you can find a gentle way of doing these things uh, then you can always, you can try and see what, see what happens. Uh, uh, is it wrong speech? It is not, if your intention is to help, it is your, if your intention is good, it's never wrong speech. Uh, it is always good. Uh, uh, but uh, be sensitive, yeah? So don't say, yeah, this is right speech, I'm going to really tell you. <laughs> don't, don't, think, don't think like that, uh, yeah? Because then, <laughs> then it is going to cause more problems as a consequence. So that is all the questions answered. Any more questions before we uh, call it a a day or, or a, a week or whatever it is? <laughs> Anything else? Yes, Barbara. <laughs> yeah, John. Uh, coming back to this phrase, uh, he beats me, he abused me, because mm -hmm. that's where I always encounter. Mm. Uh, so if a spouse were to abuse uh, their partner for many, many years, sometimes 20 years, 30 yeah. years, and if she, he or she keeps on having this attitude of, oh, he beats me, mm. uh, let mm. me accept it, maybe it's my karma, mm. until maybe one day uh, he or she might be suicidal or yeah. homicidal. So what uh, does Ajahn's uh, mm. view on this? Yeah, it is, uh, this teaching does not mean that you should just accept things. It doesn't mean that you should just go with what is already there. Uh, what it means is more like your mental attitude. Uh, so what it means is that if you live in an abusive relationship and that there is no, uh, there is no way, that, you know, after you, you, you understand fairly quickly that this is not going to stop because it already has gone on for a while uh, and you realize there's only one way you have to get out of the relationship. That's the only kind of reasonable thing. Uh, so if you live in that sort of relationship, don't carry on uh, because uh, uh, um, often you live in the kind of stupid hope that maybe it's going to come to an end, but uh, uh, usually it doesn't. It just keeps on going and going and going. So you, what you do is you get out of the relationship, but you also have the attitude. You also have the right attitude. You don't think he beat me, abused me. You also learn. Ideally, you also learn to forgive at the same time. Uh, so you look after yourself and you forgive at the same time. You both go out, leave the relationship and you forgive. That is the most powerful combination. Uh, but you don't allow these things to go on. Uh, that is an abuse of the Buddhist teachings. It's the wrong way to think about Buddhism. Uh, not the right way. Uh, so you have, yeah, uh, make that to yourself. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, if the person is a Buddhist, uh, they might be able to uh, accept such things, but sometimes the uh, person is not a Buddhist. Uh, so I have to use other ways, you know, skillful means. Um, yeah. What do I want to say? Um, so, uh, like, like I have a case where I followed the case for about 10 years. <laughs> the, because the children were young and her, her job is not that... Uh, the, the, the income from the job will not be able to sustain her or the children if she leaves. So, uh, in that case, so she, she find it difficult to leave yeah. uh, and has to uh, live with it and get a lot of support from the community. Fr yeah. From what? From the community. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes no family support. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. 
Well, that's the f yeah, exactly. It's, it's often very difficult, yeah, and these things make it more complicated yeah, because you have to look after your children. You have to make your ch sure your children kind of are looked after properly. So it makes it very hard, uh, and uh, so it is a very difficult calculation. So you have to kind of weigh everything up somehow, and then decide decide what to do on that basis. Uh, but uh, it shouldn't be the case that you have to live in an abusive relationship uh, almost regardless. You really want to avoid that because. Uh, it is so destructive in the long run, and also even for your children, you know, to, if you live in an abusive relationship, your children will probably know about it, what's going on, uh, and because they know it, it's also very bad for them as well, you know. Uh, so sometimes then it's better to live in a bit more poverty, uh, uh, but outside of that relationship, uh, than to actually carry, carry on, because it's bad for everyone involved. Uh, so, uh, yeah. But it is, of course, it's difficult, always, always very hard. And that's why people stay in these relationships, even though it is so much suffering, yeah? It's kind of crazy, yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. yeah Ajahn, I just want to ask something, Ajahn. Uh, this open awareness, uh, do we actually meditate, uh, I know we were taught, like, meditate with open eyes? <laughs> yeah, that is, some pajana, some kai or? Um, <laughs> It, yeah, when you meditate, you you don't focus. It's kind of like not focusing on anything, but just yeah. look into your mind, but actually opening your eyes. Yeah, it depends and what depends what you want to do. It depends what you want to achieve. If if all you want to achieve is to kind of get to know your mind and get to know your content of your thoughts and find out what your defilements are a bit, uh, you can do that in many contexts. You can just go for a walk in the forest, yeah. If it's peaceful and nice, you, and you ha have self awareness, you can have some awareness of what's going on. Uh, or you can just sit there in a chair and just relax, yeah, not doing anything in particular, and you can have awareness of your mind. Uh, whether you can call that meditation or not is a different question. I don't know, you know whether it's really meditation. Usually when the Buddha talks about meditation, it means bhavana is sitting down you know, and being aware of your breath or something like that. So, so it means you have to close your eyes or, or very individual? Because, uh, yeah. It depends what you want to do. It, if, you, if you want to watch the breath, absolutely you should close your eyes. To watch the breath without closing your eyes is almost impossible uh, because it's so, so distracting. Uh, yeah? Uh, but uh, it depends again what you want to do. You you can't practice the Dhamma with eyes open because we do that all the time. Yeah, we always try to be virtuous and kind and change our thinking habits, and we do that normally when our eyes are open. Uh, so you can do things with your eyes open. It just depends on what exactly that it is that you are aiming at. Uh, so uh, open awareness with open eyes is something you can do, but it's not going to lead to the same results as watching the breath with eyes closed. Uh, there are different things done at different times for different purposes, uh, and that's what you have to be aware of. Uh, yeah. 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 It does, uh, but you don't know whether he's meditating or not, yeah? So you're not sure. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Sure, why not? You know, as you start with that and then you kind of move on. Of course you can, yeah. No, no problems. Uh, it's just a gradual thing, yeah. 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 Only next year you'll come back. <laughs> and next year, yeah. give them an exam about this year topic. S say again? Give them examinations. Examinations. <laughs> yeah. Oral, yeah. not, oral. Yeah. not written. Yeah, oral, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they work the yeah. effort. Yeah. <laughs> The, the, the examination is, I come here, and if people kind of are kind, and they're friendly, and they do the right thing, then they have passed the exam, yeah? That's the <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is the way, yeah. yeah. I also like to thank the, you know, everything, uh -huh. especially the BGF people, I think it's important <laughs> that, uh, you know, allow me to be here, and, uh, uh, you know, join with you all here, and thanks, uh, Ajahn Brahmi, for you know, your teaching. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you for coming. It's nice to have a bikini as well. Yeah, it's not every day you get the chance to have a bikini. So that's, that's really nice. Yeah. <laughs> D David. Oh, sorry, Linda. You wanna say? Okay. Yeah. Um, um, I'm talking about this Facebook. Uh, Ajahn doesn't have a Facebook account, yeah. but I don't know whether um, whether you realize that there is a Ajahn Brahms fan club. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ajahn Brahms fan club where you can find a lot of uh, information uh, about Ajahn. Ajahn Brahmali. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like um, where you go, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Like you know, you're going to um, yeah. um, to England, you know, to give uh, talks or, or you know things like that. Yeah, yeah. so we know your movements. <laughs> 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 not, not hugging you though, but then you know it's nice to know that. Uh, then some of some of the participants they, they do put in a Facebook, you know, the talks and all that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so okay. in addition to that, we can also okay. learn. Yeah. <laughs> Good. No, that's good. I'm, I'm, I don't mind that at all. If, if people want to do that, that's up to them, you know. Uh, but I have nothing to do with it, so that's okay. Yeah, yeah thank you. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Ajahn, just uh, wanting to go back onto the uh, meditation, <laughs> about having the eyes closed. Uh, I read somewhere in the suttas that the Buddha said there's 40 meditation objects. Um, uh, I think it's like 10 casinas and 6 of the casinas you can use to get all the way through to the 4th Vyanas. Yeah. So, uh, when you were saying about meditating with eyes closed yeah. to get deep samadhi, then I assume the casinas you have to have your eyes open to actually meditate. So I wonder what your, uh, your thoughts were on yeah. these uh, objects where you need your eyes open. Well, the, you, in the, with the, the casinas you start off with your eyes open. Uh, and until you get a mental image, uh, yeah, and then once you get the mental image, then you will close your eyes because then the, then the external becomes a, a distraction from the mental image. Uh. So it's only it's you use that as a preliminary to give rise to the, to the mental image, and then you close your eyes, and then you take it into the jhanas be after that. Uh. So it's kind of a stage-wise, stage-wise process. Uh. But uh, in um, it's true, in that kind of situation, you, you would start with your eyes open, so part of the meditation you will develop presumably quite a bit of stillness already with your eyes open, that kind of, uh, that kind of situation. Uh, but uh, the casinas are, uh, they are very kind of uh, uh, peripheral uh, in the Buddhist teachings, yeah, they are listed in a few places but not really explained very much. Uh, and uh, they, uh, the, the place where the casinas become very important is in the Visuddhimagga, because in the Visuddhimagga, the entire path to jhana is explained in terms of the earth casina. You use the earth casina to kind of give, give rise to the first jhana. That's where it really becomes explained in detail. Uh, but in the suttas, there's almost no explanation. They're just given a list of ten casinas, uh, different colors, space, and, and, the, and consciousness, and these kind of things. Uh, but beyond that, you don't really know much about them. So. Sometimes you wonder whether the casinas were a Buddhist invention or whether they existed in India prior to that, and then maybe they were taken on board by the Buddhist because they could be used for samadhi, just to kind of you know have the full specter of meditation pos exercises, uh, possibly. Uh, so I don't know how Buddhist even they are to be to be honest with you, uh, but they are been, they have been drawn drawn in like that, uh, but they are. Yeah, they are peripheral. They are peripheral, and you're right, though, uh, that in that case, normally you would start with your eyes open. Yeah, yeah. Okay, anyone, anyone else? Everyone is. Does that mean you are tired, or does it mean you're happy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Answer <Uncertain>, happy. <laughs> okay, bit of both. Tired kind of happiness. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else wants to say anything here? No, uh, everyone is okay here. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, <laughs> so in that case, uh, I should say it has been very nice to be here as usual in the BGF. Uh, 
one of the great benefits of being a monk, that whenever you travel in the world, all you ever meet is nice people. Yeah? Everyone is usually nice. Uh, and that is the nice thing. You meet good Buddhist people everywhere, uh, even in places like Norway, which is kind of far away, cold, and really, even there you meet nice Buddhist people. So this is one of the benefits that no one is aware of, of becoming a Buddhist monk, uh, is that you actually meet so many nice people in your life. Uh, I didn't know that before I ordained. If I had known that, I would have ordained maybe even earlier, because <laughs> it was such a nice thing. Uh, <laughs> So I wish you all well, and just uh, remember, just the most important thing on the Buddhist path is just uh, commitment and perseverance. Uh, if you commit and you persevere, uh, then you will have success. Uh, and the way to commit and persevere is just to continuing to uh, study the Dhamma, to uh, listen to the word of the Buddha, and then uh, allow yourself gradually to uh, you know, be brainwashed by that beautiful word of the Buddha. And as you do so, uh, then this whole thing tends to come together. Uh, so, I, that's all, so good luck everyone, uh, and uh, enjoy, uh, and then maybe, we'll have, who knows, maybe we'll see you again next year. <laughs> Bobby. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Dear Chan, on behalf of all the participants here and the organizers, we'd like to say a big thank you to Achan, sadhu. And uh, also, uh, we'd like to have a group photo with Achan. And uh, before that, could Achan lead us in the sharing of merits? Of course, yeah, sharing of merits we shall do, yeah, absolutely. So this sharing of merits is also for uh, Chua Ka Leong. Uh, and uh, so, okay. So let's do the sharing of merit together. Edang men yatinang ho tu sukita hon tu yo Edang me nyate nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyata yo Edang me nyate nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyata yo Sadu 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 <laughs> Very good Let's pay respect to the Buddha as well. So we'll do that while we add it. Just the last last time. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>